I got your text. Sorry, man. We're just going to uh, quickly go through, try to, uh, first of all, if, if the only way to not get a uh, complication with a hip fracture is to not operate. So we'll, we'll get that out of the way right now. Everyone's going to have a failure. You have to, or, or you're not doing the surgery. So how, how do we prevent uh, our failures? How do we prevent her from winding up back where she is? So when we talk about hip fracture, it's kind of a nebulous term, right? You hear hip fracture. So we're doing the that study with Penn to see what's anesthetics the best. When you look at the sheet, it basically includes everything down to the subtroke uh, as defined as the hip fracture. So we'll go over the most common ones to fail. The displaced femoral neck is the bugaboo for, for pretty much every orthopedist here. It's, it's probably still an unsolved fracture with the exception of the arthroplasty literature that's coming out now. I think it behooves all of us in trauma to stay real facile with, with arthroplasty, especially moving forward. So what defines a failure? Failure is defined as loss of fixation, AVN, or non-union in, in a displaced femoral neck. So this guy on the right, he, he's not going to have any failures with his femoral necks. He just doesn't answer his call button. But the new risk factors coming out, the big one that you see on there that's an independent risk factor is, an, is a preoperative low albumin. So th this is critical that we catch this, get them on a good nutrition program. At our hospital, our nutrition program lacks a bit, but the, you know, we at least get them some Ensure approved by their insurance. The other thing is that when you're finished, if you have an angulation greater than 20 degrees on your posterior uh, view, then the construct choice will go over. And of course, the reduction. I mean, the reduction, an anatomic reduction has a much better chance to have a successful result than a, uh, a any malrotation or off reduction. So this is what we touched on earlier, right? This is changing the game a little bit. Uh, this is early stuff. So uh, I do think we're behind on when we should do total hip arthroplasties, but that's, that's coming our way. I think we're going to see more of these treated with total hip arthroplasty because the dislocation rates are a bit historic. I mean, that we really should not have many dislocations uh, with the new modern uh, total hips uh, available. So th this is where we're talking about construct. What's the best construct for a displaced femoral neck fracture? So if you look at this, pretty discouraging, right? This is a recent article out of uh, Shock Trauma, where you know, they do a good job fixing the next. If you look at the good and excellent results, good and excellent results, any fixation, 25% failure rate, one out of four fail. So this, this is terrible. If someone came into your office as a joint replacement surgeon and you said, you know, you got a 25% chance you're gonna fail, they'd walk right out of your, right out of your office. So the best scenario, the best construct has been proven to be a fixed angle device, a sliding hip screw, uh, DHS. Had the lowest amount of AVN in this and uh, versus the screws, the better uh, overall survival rate. But in the best case scenario, of that being an anatomically reduced displaced femoral neck and a uh, sliding hip screw or fixed angle device, 15% failure rate. Uh, if you want to be glass half full, it's 85% you know, success rate, which will go over what's defined as a success. So we'll go over a couple of failures here that we, you know, we pull off of our M&Ms. This was a 29-year-old uh, lady involved in motor vehicle accident, no antecedent pain, comes in, previous nailing, obviously, of the displaced femoral neck fracture. Uh, pardon, take her, took her immediately to the operating room. If you look here closely, the calcar is, uh, is malreduced. And the, uh, if you look closely at the tip apex, it, it's also not uh, optimal, right? So this is not an optimal... Uh, construct for healing of the femoral neck. If you look at the barrel of the DHS, it's crossing the fracture. So, so there's a couple of things could have done uh, better here. So she winds up six months out with loss of fixation. So she's unfortunately in that um, 25, as high as, as high as 50% in some of the literature's uh, failure rate. So now she's a 29-year-old you know, with, with a total hip replacement. So, so really when we're doing this surgery, it has to be done open on a young person. You have to look at the fracture. I, I argue, we, are, we, we generally use the Smith-Peterson approach and then put our hardware in uh, via lateral approach, but you're sitting right there with autograph staring you in the face. So if there's any common issue, we grab the autograph, pack it in, give her every chance to heal this thing um, and have what, 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 they, what they would deem as a success, which is essentially a healed fracture with no AVN. That, that's what, if you look at the, the uh, literature, that's what is considered a success. So here, here's another patient, again, displaced femoral neck, a young lady, 28 years old, automobile accident. You see the CT scan. There is some comminution anteriorly. So in, the, in this case, you can, you can kind of see where the uh, calcium pellets are up in the uh, iliac wing. So we, we elected to get the bone graft to Smith-Pete. 
because of the combination, I had to put a plate on prior to the, uh, to the fixed angle device. And so she went on to be considered a success, but, she, but she's, a, you know, she's back to work, walks with a near normal gait pattern, uh, not perfect, she's over two years out. But if you look, she, you know, her neck shortened some and she, she healed. So if I was writing my paper up, I would say this is a success, but it, it, you know, it's a malunion. Um, and so, you know, in, in 10 years from now, she, she may need a, a hip replacement, she may want a hip replacement. Currently, she's you know, doing fine. So you have, to, you, have to give it, you have to give these your all. You know, they're not fun. Everybody cringes when they come in in the morning and see what's come in that night because you know it's going to be a, you know, it's, it's an arduous case. You've got to go in there, look at the bone, and, and fix it properly. And I, I really do think it's critical to put some bone graft in because it's staring you right, right in the face with the approach. This is the uh, historic article that everybody talks about with the tip apex. It's, you know, come into some debate, but re really I think it's a good thing to, to keep as a goal in mind when you're fixing one of these fragility fractures or unstable intertroch fractures. You want your tip apex to be within 25. The, the screw cutouts in this study were occurring at, at, at 38. So you look at the, the diagram there, it'll explain to you what a tip apex is, right? The center of the head on the AP and lateral views, additive, and you want it within 25 in general. More so, I think it, it dictates that you've got a good reduction if you're able to get it in the center of the head. If you're not, you're most likely malreduced and giving yourself a higher chance of failure. They, there was an interesting study about 10, 10, 15, 10, I'm sorry, 10 years ago that just studied all comers of, of this 31A2 fracture, the, the comminuted um, intertrochanteric hip fracture comparing the you know, uncemented hemiarthroplasties versus those treated with intramedullary nail. And over time, it was proven that the, uh, the nail is a better way to go with, the, with, that, with that fracture. The femoral medialization uh, is a concept everybody's familiar with. Everybody's been tested on it in their OITEs and growing up on your boards. You know, you don't put a DHS on a reverse oblique fracture. The, the, the femoral shaft medializes. But th this is the only study really functionally to prove that that's a problem. In, in the older studies, it was all based on healing. So the, a lot of times these would heal with severe malreductions. So people that were living and living past a year were having significant pain, significant decrease in their... Uh, ambulatory potential. And this, this study showed with the DHS with the, with the 31A2s, which are the comminuted, posterior medial comminuted uh, intertrochs and the reverse obliques, um, they were medializing significantly and the recommendation was for, you know, nail treatment of these. So I think that's one thing that's uh, starting, to, starting to change. We wanted to have these anatomic when they heal, not just have them healed. So here's an example, again, one of our uh, guys on call had a 93-year-old lady, she walks with a walker. Typical, for, I, I don't know you guys here, but we, we, well, I can't remember the last time we saw a simple intertroch. It, it, maybe, maybe five years ago, I don't know. No one gets them anymore. So it's, the, it's similar to the uh, x-ray you saw from Dr. Brady. So we get these, we usually get uh, a traction view. If you look at this traction view, uh, this is what it'll look like when you, if you put it on a fracture table. This is us uh, pulling traction on it to see what's gonna happen. And I would argue this one should be done in the lateral position, plus minus nailing, but have, a, have an arthroplasty sitting right next to you, because uh, you'll know pretty soon if you're going to fail and not be able to anatomically reduce this. So you see they, they elected uh, to do it on a fracture table. So you have artificial kind of union. If you look at that pin, it's not in a terrible position right there. It's a little bit um, actually posterior, just a slight bit high. But look here as you go. This is when they let off the traction to try to reduce the um, fracture. They have no control over that head. If you looked at the, the, the um, screws have migrated proximally and anterior. So r right now, this has failed. It gets worse. Th this, is the, this is the PACU view. So this is a 93-year-old walking, living semi-independently at home, and now this is her uh, PACU result. So this is what she wound up with. She wound up with a quick conversion to a hemi, not that bad. I think it was the next, next day they did. So when we're getting these, a lot of times we have the advantage of they, they almost always get CAT scans on every patient we see. Uh, so we could, usually don't have to order them to get a CT at them in pelvis. You grab them and take a look at them. This one is a 90-year-old, similar type of fracture. You can see it's uh, got some troke involvement, a coronal split in the troke and neck. We like to do this uh, laterally 
it gives us a better shot at an anatomic reduction. You can do limited open results and you can get things reduced uh, so that they're stable so she can get up, walk on it right away. And you know you're, you know you're not going to have a, a, a early failure with this. Just a quick word on subtrochs because we see a fair number of them sent in um, malreduced and, and with non-unions. This is a patient that this is their, their uh, post-op view following a uh, I am nailing of a subtroke. So the, you know, the guy did his tough case. He got through it pretty happy, you know, got a rod in the femur. So, so previously we were taught they all healed. But if you look closely, this is a significant amount of varus and flexion. So critical is your starting point on these subtrochs. These nails, at least the nails we use, the recon nails, and the, have a four degrees of valgus on them. But if you sit there and measure off the tip of your troke to where you're going to enter that femur, it's significantly more than four degrees. So you get, we, we move our starting points way medial, almost between piriformis and the uh, troke header to keep us out of varus. So you see here's a result. She's broken half, uh, non-union. When you're having to do one of these non-unions, if you look at that drill bit, you want to fill up that lateral uh, hole they made basically with their lateral starting point so that you don't fall into that as you're doing the, uh, the revision work. You can do this also if you notice you've fallen into varus intra-op, just stop. Pull, pull your nail out, fill it up with, with drill bits or screws and redo your starting point and it'll fall back into some valgus for you. So she went on, on the heel fine. This is just an example of a, you know, a bad, a bad subtroke. We treat almost all of our subtrochs in the lateral position on the fracture table. Is that what you guys do here? Or you guys, most people use fracture tables or, I, I think it's a hard fracture to do on a, on a fracture table. So, but, so most of them we do lateral. Um, you can just see, you can make a kind of focal incision if you need to. It, it really relaxes all the deforming forces on your proximal femur by, just by putting them lateral oftentimes just fall, kind of fall gently into position for you and you have access uh, to do more work if you need to. This just reiterates the starting point. That red line shows you where to put your, uh, your screws or, or, uh, or drill bits if you need to revise the nail out of, out of varus. This is that lady with the, with the lateral side. So just some quick, quick uh, comments on some tools if you get into trouble. These long spiral proximal femurs, there's been some newer stuff coming out that the results of an anatomically reduced proximal femur are better and there's, there's no uh, increase in complication with the utilization of the cables. When I was a resident, you would have been put in orthopedic jail uh, with that x-ray on, on the right. It gets the patients up moving around quicker and their functional outcomes are looking better. The uh, next thing, just always have bone hook in your arsenal, you can see the pretty comminuted x-ray and once you get, a, get that read, a lot of times you can just get it off the lateral cortex, that trochanter right there, you can see the, the triangle spike on the shaft. Once that keys in, the, the case pretty much over, you can have, uh, you just take it home with your starting point and you're, and you're done. Traction views, we said about this earlier, we get them on a lot of these fractures to determine which way we're going to position them. So this lady, fortunately, don't have her, uh, all I have is her traction views, but it was very difficult to judge what really what was going on with this fracture. Once you pull that thing out, you can see what's going on, right? You got a bad trochanter, you got a femoral neck, and probably going to have to open this in a young person. And so that, that assisted us in uh, our preoperative plan, and then uh, it allows you to make, make better decisions than when you're in the operating room so you're not surprised. And this is just, uh, thanks for bearing with all of the mistakes we just showed you.